this is Mrs. Bosega here, and today we're looking at the Unit 6 review for the course 5470. So let's get started. First off, notice that these little bits right here in the review, those are designed to show you what things you should be able to do. So the items in this section are going to practice having you describe the role the force plays in the structure of an atom. It's going to have you describe why the electric force is cancelled out on a scale larger than an atom. And all of these other things are items that I will ask on the test. So in the review, we have you answer them here. I would review these bits. This is a study guide for you, so you know what you should be able to do. So here we go. In the first experiments in electrostatics, Ben Franklin takes a glass rod and rubs it with silk. The glass rod becomes positive. We know the positive charge is a proton. The passing of charge from one object to another, though, is due to electrons. That's why it's called electricity, folks. Electrons are lighter than protons. Plus, they're not bound up in the nucleus, prevented from moving. So the passing of charge is always due to electrons, and you'll hear me say it again, the protons stay still. So before the materials are rubbed with silk, it starts as neutral. So in this case, most objects are electrically neutral until you do something drastic to them. In this case, the drastic thing is charging by friction. So they take the glass, rub it with the silk, and now the glass is positively charged, so that must mean the silk is negatively charged. If the glass became positively charged, it must have lost electrons. That leaves the glass positive, but by conservation of charge, those electrons must have gone to the silk, so the silk is negative. In the picture, we can see that before, most objects are neutral, so we would say two neutral objects. Then it gets charged by friction. It's not conduction where it just taps, it's friction. Electrons are forcibly removed from the glass rod. So that when I get into the after picture, if I know the glass rod is positive, then the silk must have gained electrons. So its previous electrons are still there, but it gains four representative electrons here, leaving the silk's charge as negative four, and the glass's charge as positive four. Charging by friction gives equal and opposite because charge is conserved. Now it says which has the larger magnitude of net charge? They're equal, because remember, magnitude is this number but absolute value. So 4 equals 4, they're equal because the same amount of charge lost by the rod was gained by the silk. So in this diagram, the electrons flowed, notice the proton stays still, and the total charge is conserved. The silk gained exactly as many electrons as the rod lost. Now, let's say I go calculate the excess number of protons. I love this question, right? I can't really have drawn them on here, because who's going to draw billions upon billions of electrons, right? But I can totally calculate this. If you scroll up, you'll see that the equation I'm using here is Q is equal to N times E. This means the charge that's on an object is equal to the number of particles, so n is for number, times the elementary charge, e is plus or minus 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So if I know the charge and I know e, because I always know e, I can divide to get n. Let's see how this looks. In this case, I have a charge of 10 to the negative 9th coulombs. So for Q, I'm putting in charge in coulombs. So that's 3.2 times 10 to the negative 9th. N is the number I am solving for that. And E is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th. 
And if you read this straight out, this says the charge is equal to the number of particles times the charge on each particle. So dividing to the other side, n is equal to 3.2 times 10 to the negative 9th over 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th. And this gives me 2 times 10 to the 10th. Now, you can check your work here. This should be some large number of particles. 2 times 10 to the 10th is 2 with 10 zeros after it. So, oh gosh, counting zeros in my head, 20 trillion protons. Notice that is a whole number. I can only have whole numbers of charges. I can't have like a fraction of a proton. So that actually automatically cancels out choices B and C. It can't be these two because those are only fractions of a proton. The number of charges needs to be some whole number, like, I don't know, 20 trillion. That's a whole number. Check. Okay, so now we take this positively charged rod and we bring it near a neutral metal sphere. Let's draw out what this looks like afterwards. So the protons stay still. I drew those first. It's on top of a nice insulating stand here, so it's not charges are going to go to the ground. When I bring the positive nearby, do the electrons go left, right, or stay with their little proton buddies? Think about it for a second. Yeah. The electrons move left because they're attracted to the positively charged rod. And because this is a conductor, the electrons are free to move. It's not an insulator where they stay bound in their little atoms. So the sphere is still neutral. Notice five positives and five negatives. And this is because the electrons move towards the rod, leaving a neutral charge but polarized. Notice if I split this in half, the net charge is zero, but it's polarized. This has a positive end and a negative end. The sphere is polarized, but no charges were transferred. Fun fact is if I were to draw in a force here, I would know that this always causes attraction. This rod is attracted to the sphere now, equal and opposite because polarization always causes attraction. Since the negative side is closer, that has more attraction than the positive side has repelling. So the sphere is polarized, that causes attraction. No charges were ultimately transferred off the sphere, um, so it is still neutral. And that's weird, because then neutral attracts. So this is the ini initial state in problem 12. I have a negatively charged rod, which means more electrons than protons. I have 10 negative charges and 3 positive, so this charge is negative 7. And initially, this conducting sphere starts as neutral. Now, it says it's allowed to touch. Now, the electrons are going to move, and they're going to move until the charges are equaled out. So if originally the charge was negative 7 and neutral, the electrons are going to flow. The electrons flow because there's this nice conductive path here. And since there's a nice conductive path, these are going to flow until they have the same amount of electric potential. Assuming these two items are about the same size, Maybe this transfers electrons until one is negative 4 and the other is negative 3. Notice that as I'm drawing, the protons don't move, the electrons do. Now I'm only going to draw some electrons on here and three extra on this side. My electrons flowed to the right because there was an open path of the conductor, and when you have conduction, it flows until there's a balance of charge. Probably should have picked a number that was divisible by two, right? Because I knew I couldn't move half of an electron, so this had to be three and four. Electrons move from the rod to the sphere. They move that way because the electrons in the rod repel each other. They repel each other into this open, neutral space. 
so that the net charge on the sphere afterwards is negative. Now, for 15, what happens to the magnitude of the charge before and after the sphere touches it? The magnitude of the charge on the rod decreases. There's fewer charges left over afterwards than there were before. And that's because those extra charges, the excess electrons, started to be shared among two objects. So the net charge on the rod decreased. For this section, charging by induction actually involves two things. Um, and while you don't need to know the vocab word of induction, you should know how charges flow, and that's enough. So before I start drawing the electrons inside the sphere, where would the electrons inside the sphere want to go? Towards the rod or away from the rod? Think about it to yourself for a second. Away from the rod, the electrons in the sphere feel the field of this negative charge coming over, and they get repelled. So they're going to get repelled to the right, and let's say they're all right here. One, two, three, four, five. Notice this is still neutral, polarized. I've got an extra one over there. Ignore that guy. Pretend that's not there. So what happens now? All these electrons are just sitting here next to the ground, and they're trying to escape from these other negative charges. The electrons are going to go flow out into the ground in order to have enough space to repel away from these. So the electrons move from the sphere to the finger. They're trying to be repelled away from the rod. The charges move in that direction because the electrons in the sphere are repelled. But that means, imagine this goes away and electrons have flowed out of it. That means I have more positive charges left over on the sphere. If the electrons left, I'd have a positive charge on the sphere because there's fewer electrons than there were before. So what happens to the magnitude of the charge on the rod after it touches the sphere? Uh, nothing. Nothing has touched the rod, <laughs> so its charge stays the same. For number 20, a group of students is playing with a negatively charged balloon, which sticks to a wall. Now, this still causes polarization. You remember polarization from before. With a conductor, the charges fully dissociate, but with an insulator, an insulator is still going to be polarized, it just looks different. A polarized insulator has the charges just moving away but staying within their own atom, so the surface of the wall is this positive charge. Polarization always causes attraction. Actually, there was a scientist that wrote a paper before Franklin um, saying that electricity only ever caused attraction. Yeah, they were wrong. <laughs> because polarization always causes attraction, he mistakenly thought that electricity always attracts, just like gravity does. But he was wrong. Anyways, the attracting force comes because the negatively charged balloon is attracted to the positive surface of the wall. So the choice there is going to be A. The electrons in the wall are repelled within their own atoms, and that makes them attract. For number 21, they bring a, new, a negatively charged balloon near a styrofoam ball covered in aluminum foil. Oh, maybe we can see little charges there. What are the possible charges on the ball? The ball could be neutral or negative, and both would still show attraction. That's why some of the experiments in class could be so finicky. Okay, so for this one, it says to draw the distribution of charges on the can that would explain why the neutrally charged can is attracted to the balloon. So the proton stays still and all items have protons, so I drew positive charges. Then electrons are repelled by electrons, so I'm going to put these on the far side of the can. Noticing because the can is a conductor, those electrons are fully dissociated from their little proton buddies. In this case, it says I have to draw, but I don't have to explain. So draw the charges that would explain. So I'm actually done here.
I drew a polarized can and that explains the attraction. Number 23. What's the difference between the insulator and the conductor? It can't be A, because this says the protons moved, so that's not true. Electrons were able to transfer from the balloon to the can, because the can is a conductor. That's not true because neither case had the can and balloon touch. Right, the can never touched the balloon, so that doesn't count. So it must be C. Electrons in the can were able to move between atoms. They fully dissociated, since it was a conductor. So it has to be C. All right, new section. We are on to doing Coulomb's Law, and we spent a pretty good amount of time in class on Coulomb's Law right before the holiday break. Coulomb's Law, be able to draw, compare and contrast with gravity, and calculate. Um, both calculate using this equation, using proportions, and using powers of 10 in the metric system. So let's start with proportions. In a proportions problem, the first thing you do is write the equation. So Fe equals kq1q2 over r squared. Then you substitute in the change. So in number 24, one of the objects becomes four times farther away. So I would put in a four for the radius, but that's four squared down there, right? So when I go do this distribution now, I'm doing 1 over 4 squared of the original force. This must be 16 times weaker than it was before. So I'm choosing choice D. Quadrupling the radial distance means the fields are 4 times farther apart, so 1 16th of the force. For number 25, one charge is doubled while the other charge is tripled. So I'm going to put K2Q1 times 3Q2. Distributing this, the 2 and the 3 come up front, so that's 2 times 3, and all the rem rest remains the same. So this must be 6 times larger than before. Notice with proportions, you always get a comparison. It's comparing to the original force. So if the original force were 10 newtons, six times more than that is 60. Now we're going to do a bunch of things together. So the charge on one doubles. So that's K, 2Q1. The charge on the other triples. That's 3, 2Q2. All over distance squared, that's 4r quantity squared. Distributing changes to the left, original equation to the right, that's 2 times 3 over 4 squared, times the original equation. So this is 6 sixteenths times the original force. And since we didn't simplify, it stays 6 sixteenths. That's kind of nice. So how do I do proportions? I write my original equation. Then I substitute the changes. Then I sort. I bring the new changes out front and the original equation to the right. So this says 6 sixteenths because the only changes that were made were to the charge and distance. Now let's calculate them. So if I want to be able to use this as an actual equation, then I need to put in charge in coulombs and distance in meters. So if you haven't done this already in your notes, k is always 9 times 10 to the 9th. q1 and q2 are the charges in coulombs, and r is the distance in meters. So in this case, one of them is negative and one of them is positive. So when I go do this equation, I can actually absolute value those numbers. So imagine I'm putting an absolute value in here. That allows me to ignore the fact that there's a negative sign. The reason I like to do that is that the negative 3 here 
can sometimes confuse people. When I do negative 3, they're like, well, is that to the power of 10? No, 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 no. Feel free to just absolute value that. All over 2.2 meters squared. Now, if you want, you can put k into your calculator. k is always 9 times 10 to the 9th, so here's how I do it on mine. I'm going to take 9 times 10 to the 9th, hit enter. Over here, hit the store button, store, alpha, k. And now every time I press k, I get that number. So I'm going to do k times 3 times 10 to the negative 6th times 9 times 10 to the negative 6th. Then the denominator, I'm going to divide by 0.2 squared. This gives me a 6 newton force. Notice this equation always gives me the magnitude of the force. It tells me the size of the force, whereas the direction would be like attract or repel. So these attract because one's positive and one's negative. The magnitude of the force is just about 6 newtons. Both forces are equal to each other, though. Notice that I have, I have two choices, or two charges. Q1 pulls on Q2. They attract each other. So if Q1 is attracted right, then Q2 must also be attracted left. Newton's third law says these must always be equal and opposite. Wait, but then what about the other force equation? F equals QE. For this, I need to be given an electric field. So I'm going to come back to this page in just a second. Let's take a look at fields. So we should be able to interpret field lines. In number 30, a bunch of things are wrong with these field lines. I know the field lines shouldn't cross. This one, let's zoom in, has two positive charges, but the shape looks like a dipole. <laughs> the charges are pointing the correct direction, or the field lines are pointing cor the correct direction for part, but not both. So the field lines should start on positive. There should be field lines pointing away from this charge. Finally, this one. Electric field lines end on negative charges or the end of the image. Now, it is drawing time. We want to draw the field. It's a lot easier for you to draw on your iPad, so feel free to do that. Mine, I unfortunately have to draw on the touchpad. All right, I know fields point away from positive charges. So I'm going to draw some nice equally spaced field lines here. Field lines point away from positive, so I've done that. The field lines don't cross. Check. It takes up the majority of the space that I'm willing to take up for this picture. Check. Um, looks good. Now let's do a dipole. This one's going to be a little tricky for me just because I'm drawing this on a touchpad, so I know it should point from positive to negative. The shape should kind of look like a melon in the center because these are attracting towards each other. So don't go crazy with lines here. I'm going to try and draw it so it takes up the majority of the space. Plus, you get into some problems sometimes. If you draw too many lines, sometimes you have the problem of like you accidentally make them cross, or one accidentally points in the wrong direction. So let's check. This should have a shape that shows attraction. The lines point away from positive and towards negative. The lines do not cross each other, and they take up the majority of the space. Finally, the parallel plate capacitor. They should be evenly spaced lines that point from positive to negative, and since I'm drawing on a touchpad, I'm going to be supremely lazy here and only draw three field lines. <laughs> as long as your lines are evenly spaced, you get the shape point. We know they point from positive to negative, they take up the majority of the space, done. Now let's interpret. 
Q1 must be a negative charge because if I look, the field lines are going towards Q1. Q1 must have more charge than Q2 because it has more field lines. Of the four locations in the picture, A has the most field, then D, then C, then B, and I'm ranking based on the density of field lines. So imagine I draw a little circle around A. It would have four or five field lines going through it. D would have two, C would have one, but B would have none. So I would rank these as A, D, C, B. So at which point would a charge experience no force if placed there? B. No field, no force. Great! On to equipotential maps. For these, you should be able to identify where the positives and negatives are, calculate the potential difference, and talk about the meaning of electric potential. Okay, so given the electric field that's shown here, if the electric field is pointing down, that must mean that these are positive charges on the top plate and negative charges on the bottom. Sorry, it's a mess. I'm on a touchpad, you know. All right, force then. The electron gets attracted upward because the electrons are attracted to positives. Check. Ah, I said I would come back to this. When I have two charges, I use the Coulomb's law equation. When I have a field acting on a specific charge, then I use Fe equals Qe. Because notice this represents the uniform field. Everything in this field experiences the same value of E because the field lines are straight. They point straight down from top to bottom. Everything in this field experiences the same E as 3,200 newtons per coulomb. But now an electron is placed in this field. It experiences an upward force. It does actually pull on the capacitor plates as well, but since the electron is so much smaller, you don't notice the capacitor move. The charge on the electron is that 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. So my charge on an electron times 32,000 still gives me a very small force, but that's because an electron is a very small thing. So it's 5.13 times 10 to the negative 15 newtons, acting on this little tiny electron. All right, depending on the time your teacher had some of these next questions you can pay attention to or not, from the equations up above, potential difference could be calculated by taking any two points and subtracting, using this electric field equation, or using this potential energy equation. Notice that all three of those would have electric potential difference in there. But I only know field and distance, so I'm going to use field and distance to get our value for V. I know the field is 3,200, or sorry, 32,000 equals the potential difference over, ooh, four centimeters, four centimeters, if you look up on the chart, centi is times 10 to the negative 2. So multiplying that number to the other side, our potential difference is 32,000 times 4 times 10 to the negative 2. This gets a potential difference of 1,280 volts. Okay, for number 41, I think by the time you get here, you'll probably have multiple choices <laughs> that can go here. Um, calculate the potential difference between the positive plate and halfway between is only half of this number. <laughs> now let's talk about that for a second, because I've kind of given you the answer here, so there's that. <laughs> hey, if I have a potential difference of 1,280, and zeros in the center, so I'm going to draw my potential lines in purple. Zeros in the center. That must mean the top plate has a charge of positive 640, and the bottom plate has a charge of negative 640, 
In order for the difference between these two to be 1280, right? Think of like if I go from the top plate to the bottom, I go down by 1280. So if I were doing my equally spaced lines here, I'd have 640, 320, 0, negative 320, negative 640. Next, the electric potential energy of an electron halfway between the plates is closest to not 0. <laughs> the reason it's not 0 is we just calculated our potential difference between the plates. Then we calculated the potential difference between the electron and the top plate. From the electron to the top plate, it would go through 640 volts of potential difference. So I'm going to leave that there. Now I'm going to calculate electric potential energy. Pulling from the equation, scroll up, this is your study guide. Electric potential energy is equal to Q delta V, and it's the delta V for what the electron would go through. It would go through from the center to the top. So Q is the charge on the electron. That's 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. V is 640. And feel free to put little um, name of thing, put little magnitude symbols, absolute value symbols here. So this has 1 times 10 to the negative 16th joules of potential energy when it's at the center. Hey, that means if it has potential energy, when it's released, it's going to change to something else. Kinetic energy. Potential energy turns to kinetic energy in this case. This is an interaction between the electron and the plates that create the field. Notice that in the center, when the electron's in the middle of the field, it has potential energy, but then it speeds up, so then it would have kinetic energy at the end. So energy bar chart is drawn, the electric potential energy was 1 times 10 to the negative 16. Finally, let's get the kinetic energy at the end and the velocity at the end. If there's 1 times 10 to the negative 16th joules of potential energy at the top, or I guess in the center, then as it's released, all of that turns to kinetic. All that kinetic energy gives it its speed, so you know what equation we're doing. We're doing 1 half mv squared. So I have 1 times 10 to the negative 16th equals 1 half mass of the electron. Look it up on your equation sheet. It's 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Then solve for V. On my hand, I, or on my end, I multiplied by 2 to the other side. Divide by the mass of the electron. And so I have something like 2.25 times 10 to the 14th equals V squared. And then I square root. So I do that to the power 1 half. This gets me a speed of 1.5 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yay! I'm happy because there's that choice as an answer. So there's my speed, there is my energy, and 43 I've done as this drawing over here. By the time you get to it, you'll be able to do a drawing too. All right, so we're on to our last section. This is just practicing the same things as before. So for a uniform electric field, notice that our potential difference is 600 volts from top to bottom, and those potential lines are drawn as evenly distributed. So my electric field is going to point down from positive to negative. As long as I draw them uniformly, you don't have to draw too many lines. I'm going to try and draw them evenly spaced. I've kind of failed, so maybe one more line over here. Alright, so let's see if it meets the criteria for <laughs> electric field drawings. It points from positive to negative. It's the correct shape. It takes up most of the space of the diagram, and none of my field lines cross. Close enough. Sorry it's not perfectly even. I would place a proton to give it its highest electrical potential energy at A. 
Remember, you get electrical potential energy wherever you're feeling repulsion. Think of this as your least stable position. If I put a proton at A, it will move. If I put a proton at E, it won't move as much because it's so close to the other plate. So there's more potential at A than E because think of it as like it's higher off the ground. But where would I put an electron to give it the highest potential energy? I don't know. Where is the electron repelled? Is it most repelled at A, B, C, D, or E? It's at E. An electron is most repelled at point E. That's where it would have the highest electrical potential energy. Now let's say they're both placed in the center of the field and released. They both have the same electric potential. Because notice the center of this field, the electric potential at C is zero. They both have the same potential. Potential is at one point. Potential difference is between two points. So both the electron and proton have an electric potential of zero. They both experience the same electric force. Now, there's another thing I could put here. They both experience the same electric field as well. Notice that in a capacitor, the field is uniform everywhere. So they'd each experience the same field. They'd each have the same potential energy, but they would have different accelerations and different velocities. Now, why is that? Um, think of it like this. They both have the same electric potential because they both have the same charge and they're both going through 300 volts of potential difference from the center to the top. Right? So they both have the same PEEL and since that's going to end up equaling kinetic energy, they're both going to have the same kinetic energy as they travel. However, they have different masses. So whichever one has more mass has less speed. Similarly, they both experience the same force because they're in the same field and they have the same charge. But the force causes the mass to accelerate. So the acceleration is smaller for the more massive object. The electron has both a faster acceleration and a faster velocity because less mass. So let's answer questions 50 through 53, assuming that we're gonna, we're gonna fill in the answers for us. So let's do some calculations here. Determine the kinetic energy of the proton just before it hits the negative plate. So the proton is at point C and it's going to the negative plate. So I want you to think of it as this. Imagine a person has held the proton up here and is preventing it from reaching this negative plate for which it so wants to go, and the line snaps. It has potential energy when it's in the center of the capacitor and kinetic energy when it touches the uh, negative plate. So if I were doing my diagram here, it has potential energy to start. That turns over to kinetic energy leaving no potential at the end. So I can use this to solve for speed. First, PEEL. I take the charge of a proton times delta V. And the delta V is this delta V that it goes through right here. That was 300 volts, because it goes from 300 volts to, or sorry, from zero to negative 300. So let's put in the charge of a proton. That's 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 times V was 300. That's 4.806 times 10 to the negative 17th joules. Now all of that turns over to kinetic energy. So solving Ke equals 1 half mv squared, solve for V. That's 4.8 times 10 to the negative 17 equals 1 half 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms V squared. Dividing by the 
mass to the other side gives me 5 times 10 to the 10th and square rooting it. So the speed is 23 is 239,910 meters per second. So even though we don't have it up on the screen anymore or don't have any selections here, the velocity of the proton as it hits the negative plate is this 240,000-ish meters per second. The proton would have the same energy as an electron, but the electron would move faster because the electron is less mass. So for my, <laughs> for my last theory, I'm going to put in some little check marks. I've answered them verbally and on paper. Close enough. All right, everyone. So I'm going to go fix that formative. Best of luck on your test. We'll see you soon.